For more than four years, the Nazis dominated Europe, but their garrisons could never rest easy. For there was always the threat of assault by elite Allied troops, the paras and commanders, specially formed to take the fight back to Nazi-occupied countries. Their raids so infuriated Hitler that he ordered that any commandos taken prisoner must be executed immediately. But this did not deter them. The attacks went on. The actions of these special forces brought hope to people enslaved by the Nazis and played a vital role in their liberation. On the 3rd of June 1940, during the final stages of the evacuation of the British Army from Dunkirk, Prime Minister Winston Churchill wrote a memorandum to the Chiefs of Staff. He complained of the wholly defensive attitude that had marked the campaign in France and demanded the formation of raiding forces to attack the coasts of German-occupied Europe. Within a few days, a call for volunteers to create a force of 5,000 men was circulated throughout the army. They were given the name commandos after the highly mobile Boer columns, which had fought the British for three years in South Africa at the beginning of the century. At first, the only troops not allowed to volunteer to become commandos were Britain's traditional sea soldiers, the Royal Marines. The Admiralty needed them on board ship to help man the guns and to protect captured enemy ports. Ten units, also to be known as commandos, each of 500 men, were formed. They came from every regiment and corps in the British Army. Many had fought in France and believed that joining the commandos would give them a quicker chance to strike back at the Germans. While the commandos were still forming, the first of Churchill's raids took place. Two were mounted in late June 1940 against the French coast and the Channel Islands, which had recently been occupied by the Germans. Neither achieved anything, and Churchill was bitter at their failure to, as he succinctly put it, kill more Germans. To overcome the lack of overall direction shown by these early raids, Churchill brought in Admiral Sir Roger Keyes as Director of Combined Operations. Keyes had made his name as commander of the Zeebrugge raid on St. George's Day, 1918. Under heavy German fire, three block ships had sealed the entrance to the canal running inland to the U-boat base at Bruges. Churchill instructed Keyes to plan for major raids to be carried out once the threat of German invasion had receded. Key's staff learned swiftly from previous mistakes. Much greater target intelligence would be needed. Inter-service planning and cooperation must be improved. And above all, the new force must be given better landing capability so that it could strike anywhere along the coastline of continental Europe. In addition to demanding more landing craft, three cross-channel ferries were converted to carry and launch them. But seaborne raids were not the only method foreseen for deploying the new force. For the British had been very impressed by the German use of paratroops during their invasions of Norway and Holland. So number two commander was turned into an airborne unit and retitled 11 Special Air Service Battalion. A course of parachute training with drops from tethered balloons and then converted Whitley bombers was introduced.
for all the new volunteers, the emphasis was not only on physical fitness and extreme endurance, but self-reliance and initiative. As one early volunteer, Sergeant Major George Haynes, later said, It was an honor, I think, to be a Sergeant Major among such men as these, who were so highly trained, so disciplined, so self-reliant. And in fact, every man in my troop was fit to be an NCO. They not only had to be experts in unarmed combat, but able to use a wide variety of weapons, including enemy types. British forces were now heavily engaged in the Mediterranean and North Africa against the Italians. So in January 1941, Keyes deployed three commandos for diversionary raids against the island of Pantelleria and then the Dodecanese. Meanwhile, the remaining commandos in Britain prepared to mount their first proper raid against occupied Europe. The first target selected for the UK-based commandos was the Lofoten Islands, off northern Norway. Some 600 troops sailed on two of the converted ferries on the 4th of March, 1941. Their immediate objective was to destroy factories which converted fish oil into glycerine for munitions. The force arrived without being spotted by the Germans, and the commandos achieved total surprise. As their landing craft went in, they were greeted jubilantly by the local fishing fleet. They were then helped ashore by the islanders. There was virtually no opposition from the German garrison, and the main ports were quickly seized. fish oil factories and storage tanks were then destroyed. With the local inhabitants joining in enthusiastically. The commandos then rounded up 60 Norwegian Nazi sympathizers. And these were taken off the islands together with 225 German sailors and troops. And 315 Norwegian volunteers who had decided to join their armed forces in Britain. Among the German prisoners of war were the crew of a trawler, which had a top secret Enigma cipher machine on board. Although the Germans managed to throw the machine overboard, the commanders were able to seize a spare set of rotors. This was of invaluable help to the cryptologists at the decoding center at Bletchley Park. One commando officer could not resist using the local telegraph station to send off a telegram addressed to A. Hitler, Berlin. It read, Reference your last speech. I thought you said that whenever British troops land on a continent of Europe, German soldiers will face them. Well, where are they? Hitler's answer was to garrison a quarter of a million troops in Norway who could better have been used elsewhere. The troops sent to the Middle East did not enjoy such a clear-cut success. Locally recruited Middle East commandos were used during the capture of the Italian colony of Eritrea, while the others, known as Lay Force, after their commander, Colonel Bob Laycock, became involved in attempts to disrupt the Axis supply lines during Rommel's first offensive, which drove the British out of Libya in the spring of 1941. Then half of Ley Force was sent to Crete to cover the British withdrawal after the German airborne invasion. The unit was virtually destroyed and Ley Force subsequently disbanded. Despite this, fresh commandos and paras continued to be trained in Britain. 
But a further delay in their deployment occurred when in October 1941, Admiral Keyes resigned in protest at a decision that all future commando operations must be agreed with the Army High Command. Churchill replaced him as Chief of Combined Operations with Lord Louis Mountbatten, a cousin of King George VI, and a distinguished destroyer captain. Mountbatten was determined to keep up the pressure with further large-scale raids. To tie down the German garrison, it was decided to revisit Norway with an attack on the port of Vagso, accompanied by a diversionary visit to the Lofotens. The aim was to seize the island of Marloy, opposite the port of Vagso, eliminate the German artillery battery there, and then occupy the port and destroy military and industrial targets. A force, including two landing ships carrying some 600 commandos, set sail from the Shetland Islands on the 26th of December 1941. They reached their objective the next morning, undetected, and the commandos began to man the landing craft. As these set off, the escorting cruiser HMS Kenya fired a salvo of star shells to illuminate Marloy for a naval bombardment and to act as a marker for RAF bombers which dropped smoke bombs to mask the landings. The Marloy force was led by one of the great characters of the early commandos, Major Mad Jack Churchill, who went into the assault armed with a broadsword and playing the bagpipes. Churchill later recorded some of the tunes he played during the assault. His men overran the island in less than 10 minutes. And, suitably overawed, the German garrison surrendered. The guns were then turned towards Vaxo town. For across the water, the Germans were resisting fiercely, and bitter house-to-house -house fighting raged for most of the morning. Mortars and high explosives were used to destroy several of the German strongholds. While the fighting continued in the town, two Royal Navy destroyers took troops to blow up a fish processing plant on the mainland, and then sank several German ships sheltering in the channel. By 1300 hours, German resistance had been eliminated, and as the remaining targets were blown up, the commandos began to retire. They had suffered 17 dead with 53 wounded, while 120 Germans were killed and 98 taken prisoner. Around 100 Norwegian civilians took the opportunity to leave with the commandos. Operation Archery, as the Varxo raid was codenamed, was a total success, both tactically and strategically. For the rest of the war, Hitler remained convinced that Norway would be invaded and never allowed the garrison to be reduced. While the commandos had been gaining their first battle honours, Britain's airborne arm had been retitled the Parachute Regiment and expanded into a parachute brigade and a glider brigade. The Paris' first important operation took place on the 27th of February, 1942. Led by Major John Frost, a team of 80 men of the 1st Parachute Battalion dropped at Bruneval on the French Channel coast. Their mission was to seize parts of a top-secret German radar installation so that measures to jam it could be developed. It had originally been intended to land commandos on the beach below the radar site, 
but an airborne landing seemed to offer a better chance of surprise, and the Paris seized their opportunity. The men were deployed in 12 converted Whitley bombers. The flight to the target went perfectly. And the men dropped undetected, a little way inland from their objective. Almost total surprise was achieved, and the radar captured for long enough for vital parts to be removed for assessment back in Britain. The raiders were then taken off by motor launch, having lost three killed and seven wounded. Among their most valuable booty was one of the German radar operators. The information obtained by the raid played a vital part in enabling RAF Bomber Command to penetrate the German aerial defences. Two other significant developments occurred in February 1942. The first Royal Marine Commando was formed. And a commando training centre was set up at Achnacarry, a country estate in the Scottish Highlands. For the remainder of the war, all commandos received their basic training there. The next significant commando raid took place a month later, against the French Atlantic port of Saint-Nazaire. The aim was to destroy its dry dock, the only one on the Atlantic seaboard of occupied Europe large enough to repair major German surface warships. HMS Campbelltown, a World War I US destroyer which had been transferred to the Royal Navy, was converted to look like a German vessel. Packed with explosives and carrying some 100 commandos, she was to be rammed into the dock gates. Once her commandos, together with another 140 carried by motor launches, had gone ashore to destroy the pumping and winding mechanisms and been withdrawn by the MLs, the Campbelltown would be exploded by delayed action fuses. Amazingly, Campbelltown, accompanied by 16 smaller craft, managed to get within about two miles of the target before the destroyer was lit up by a searchlight. She was flying the ensign of the Kriegsmarine, and the Germans hesitated for a few vital minutes before opening a withering fire. As Commando Captain Bob Montgomery later described, Coming up the Loire in Campbelltown, the fire really was getting very heavy indeed. It seemed to be coming from all directions at once, and it wasn't very long before the coxswain on the wheel was killed and another sailor took his place. He was killed almost immediately. I, thinking I was the only one there, stepped forward, took the wheel, not really knowing what I was going to do with it. Luckily, Tibbets, from behind, tapped me on the shoulder, took the wheel away from me before I could do any damage. Then the Kriegsmarine ensign was hauled down and replaced by the battle ensign of the Royal Navy. The Campbelltown went in at 20 knots. She struck the dock at 01.34 hours, just four minutes behind schedule. The bow crumpled 36 feet in, lodging the hidden explosives firmly against the gate. Among the first commandos ashore was the second in command, Major Bill Copeland. Looking at her, it looked as though every Gun in the world was firing shot of one sort or another into her poor battered sides in the glare of what seemed to be about six searchlights. The commandos fanned out across the dock heading for their objectives. 
And now the Germans are going to get a taste of what they've been giving us. Although wounded before leaving Campbelltown, Lieutenant Stuart Chant led his demolition team to their target. Now, this was my objective, the pump house. Uh, on the way here, I'd thought about what would happen if we found a watchman inside, and I decided we'd have to shoot him. We didn't have the time to mess about. I then went to open the door, and strangely enough, it was locked. In all our planning, we'd never considered that the door would be locked. A borrowed sledgehammer quickly solved this, and Chant and his team raced in. I had a lot of confidence in my chaps. They followed me without a word, each clinging to each other's rucksack. And we walked away pretty smartly down these stairs. Don't forget, it was practically completely dark and got darker as we went on. Nobody said anything. Each of us went to a pump. I took this pump here, number three, and out of our rucksacks, we took these specially prepared charges. There were eight of them, five pounds in weight, specially prepared, waterproof, duplicate leads. And they were laid as planned into the most sensitive parts of each pump. Eight charges per pump. Chant then ordered his men back to the surface. So I pulled the percussion igniter, giving us 90 seconds to get up those stairs, 40 feet up onto the ground floor and out of the way before the whole thing blew up. As the party emerged, Captain Bob Montgomery spotted them. Stuart Chance and his team came out through the door, crouched down under the wall, and I knew they were a bit close, so I moved them back, and it was just as well I did, because there was a rucksack left here, which was crushed. The pump house was totally destroyed, as were the winding machines which opened the lock gates. It was now time for the commandos to withdraw to the motor launches, but it soon became obvious that this would not be possible. Bob Montgomery had been totally focused on ensuring that the demolition was completed successfully. And it was only then when Stan Day drew my attention to the river, where the MLs were burning fiercely that I realized that the old mill was still in German hands and we were unlikely to get home. Faced with this, Colonel Charles Newman, the landing force commander, instructed his men to fight their way out. So began what the commandos later called the Saint Nazaire steeplechase. And then we, we moved on up side streets, over walls, through hen coops, into glass houses, through kitchen doors, into roads, saw German armor, and finally, having got ourselves thoroughly exhausted, having no ammunition left, because we'd had to fight our way through this little lot, having too much wounded, we finally went to ground. By daylight the next morning, most of the survivors had been rounded up. They were taken off to be held in a local restaurant. The Germans now swarmed over HMS Campbelltown. They failed to spot the explosives and began hunting for souvenirs. Among the survivors was her captain, Lieutenant Commander Sam Beatty. Soon after that, I was interrogated by a German who spoke very good English. He discovered that I'd been in Campbelltown and he was remarking that it was no good ramming a stout cassoon like that with a flimsy ship. At that moment, there was a bang, a very large bang. In fact, it broke one of the windows in his office. I was asked no more questions because he obviously wanted to find out what the bang was, and I was hoping that I knew what the bang was. And a ring of chairs went through this restaurant when we heard this terrific explosion, which could be none other than six tons of Amatol in Campbelltown going up. More than 380 Germans were killed and the dock gate was demolished. 
The dock remained out of action for the rest of the war. For the commandos, Operation Chariot, the raid on Saint-Nazaire, became known as the greatest raid of all. Five Victoria Crosses and 131 other gallantry medals and awards were made following the raid, and the survivors paraded through the town after the war for the opening of a special memorial. In August 1942, Mountbatten mounted another major raid, this time to test the German defences at the French Channel port of Dieppe. The main landings were carried out by the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division. They were a disaster, with few men actually getting off the beaches and into the town itself. Numbers 3 and 4 commandos were given an important part in the raid. They were to silence the coastal batteries situated on each side of the port and dominating the approaches. Peter Young, who was to end the war as commander of a commando brigade at the age of 27, led the only group from number three commando to achieve its objective. Looking out to the, on the Epps side, I could see there was a big cornfield. And um, you, you know how in the army you're told that two bricks will stop a bullet and things. I then announced that nine feet of corn would stop a bullet. And my soldiers, unfortunately, believed this or appeared to. And we then ran out in the cornfield and we opened a fairly heavy fire, not very rapid, because I was trying to keep down the rate of fire because I hadn't got very much ammunition. And after a very short time, the Germans turned round the left-hand gun, number four, and fired it straight at us. And there was a bloody great bang, and orange and black smoke came out of this thing, and it wandered over our heads and burst in a valley somewhere in France behind us. I then actually thought, well, what a very good thing, because if they were, they're firing their guns at us and, and missing, they're certainly not firing at the British fleet. And looking round towards Dieppe, I decided that uh, it would be uh, wise to withdraw, because clearly they could produce tanks or something in, in my cornfield. This would be very uh, uncharitable. On the other flank, Lord Lovett's number four commando was more successful. James Dunning commanded a mortar team. As soon as the signal came to fire, we opened up with the mortar. The first one fell a bit to the left, so we adjusted the angle of the mortar, and the second one went smack into the middle of the battery. The, um, we kept it at that angle. The, the next one, the third shot, actually hit the ammunition dump in the battery, and there was smoke and flames, and we knew we'd score the bullseye. Captain Pat Porteous led the charge on the battery itself and won the Victoria Cross. What was left of F Troop, I suppose about 50 men, formed up behind a low bank about 100 yards from the actual gun pits. I gave the order to fix bayonets and charge, and we dashed across uh, this open ground. Bullets coming from all directions. There was no sort of fixed in direction where the enemy were. And um, we finally got to the guns uh, to find a scene of terrible desolation. Uh, the first gun that I reached uh, was the one in which Mills Roberts's mortar bomb had landed. And there were bodies all over the place and an awful shambles. The success of the commandos was the only bright spot in an otherwise black day. Their attack included the first action of the newly formed US Rangers, 50 of whom fought with the commandos. Alongside the major raids, the commandos continued with pinprick attacks on the coasts of occupied Western Europe. During one of these on the Channel Islands in early October 1942, German troops were tied up to prevent them from escaping. This enraged Hitler, who issued his notorious commando order. Any commandos captured, whether in uniform or not, were to be summarily executed. The first victims of this were glider-borne engineers sent to attack the Norsk Hydro heavy water plant at Vermork, Norway, on the 19th of November, 1942. 
The heavy water was vital to Germany's development of an atomic bomb, but the two gliders and their bomber tugs both crashed. 14 men, six of them badly injured, survived one of the crashes. After the briefest of interrogations, they were shot by a German firing squad. In spite of this new danger, both the commandos and the paras were expanding as they developed a new role. This was the support of amphibious landings. Number five commander was involved in the assault in May 1942 to occupy the Vichy French-held island of Madagascar. And in November, both paras and commandos took part in the torch landings in northwest Africa. It was during the subsequent Tunisian campaign that the aggressive patrolling of the paras led the Germans to call them the Red Devils after the color of their berets. Both paras and commandos were used to spearhead the landings in Sicily and Italy, and a new theater opened for them in August 1943 when Mountbatten was appointed Supreme Allied Commander, Southeast Asia. He soon requested commandos to be sent out, and 3rd Special Service Brigade arrived in India in early 1944. This was to take part in a series of landings designed to outflank the Japanese during the Allied advance in Burma. Back in Britain, Bob Laycock, who had taken the commandos to the Middle East in early 1941, had succeeded Mountbatten as commander of combined operations. The emphasis was now on preparing for D-Day. And as part of the build-up, a number of cross-channel reconnaissance raids were carried out, many by the French troops of the Inter-Allied Commando, which had been recruited from troops from German-occupied countries. The plan for D-Day itself was for the 6th Airborne Division to be dropped on the left flank of the landing area while the American 82nd and 101st Airborne secured the right flank. The two commando brigades would land on the British beaches, with the majority concentrating on sword, so as to link up with the paras. Not until they were in their sealed camps were the paras and commandos briefed on their detailed objectives. And on the evening of the 5th of June, the paras climbed into their transports and gliders. BBC reporter Richard Nimbleby was with them. Taking off from here loaded with parachutists, taking with it perhaps the hopes and the fears and the prayers of millions of people in this country who sleep tonight not knowing that this mighty operation is taking place. There she goes now, the first aircraft leading the attack on Europe. The vast air armada crossed the French coast. Soon the green lights came on and the first paras began to drop. D-Day had begun. Major John Howard and his Gliderborn company had the most challenging task. They had to seize and hold two vital bridges spanning the River Orne and the Caen Canal on the extreme left flank of the invasion beaches. The gliders swooped in towards John Howard's particular target, the bridge over the Caen Canal, which was to be immortalized as Pegasus Bridge. Say so you're sitting facing one another, you link arms, you do a butcher's grip, like that. You lift your legs, and you just pray to God. And before we almost had time to do that, there was the first thump of the land. I stepped out of that glider, I looked up, and 50 yards away from me was the tower of that bridge. And not only that, but the nose of the glider was right through the wire defences around the enemy around the enemy post, where I'd asked the glider, not thinking of uh, glider pilots, not thinking for one moment they'd be able to do it, number one glider must go through, through that wire. The German defenders were totally surprised and quickly overwhelmed. But now came the task of holding Pegasus Bridge and that over the River Orne until the commandos could relieve them. The paras dug in. With the dawn came the seaborne landings, the commandos among the first waves. 
Lord Lovett's men swiftly reached John Howard on Pegasus Bridge. Among them was Ken Fillett. Lord Lovett remarked, sorry we're late, chaps. I looked at my watch, and that, according to my watch, we were two minutes late. And when one thinks that that particular um, thing was planned in England many, many weeks ago, not knowing what opposition we would encounter and the fact that we had covered something like 10 miles and we were only two minutes late in linking up with the Paris, I think was rather fantastic. For the next two months, the commandos and Paris remained in the line, holding the left flank of the Allied beachhead against numerous German attacks. Only when the Allies broke out of Normandy in mid-August and began their lightning advance across northern France were the commandos in Paris finally brought back to Britain to refit. But they would both soon face fresh challenges. For overstretched supply lines brought the Allies to a halt in September 1944 and Field Marshal Montgomery proposed a daring airborne operation to break the stalemate. He wanted to outflank Germany's main natural obstacle in the west the River Rhine, by capturing a series of bridges over waterways in Holland. The US 101st Airborne Division would drop north of Eindhoven and the 82nd in the Nijmegen area. Finally, the British 1st Airborne Division, reinforced by the Polish Independent Parachute Brigade, would seize the final bridge, that over the Lower Rhine at Arnhem. A ground force British 30 Corps would simultaneously advance and relieve the Paris in turn. The Paris were only given six days in which to plan and prepare for the operation. Nevertheless, every man was convinced that they were about to strike a war-winning blow, unaware of some of the concerns of their commanders. The RAF insisted that to avoid anti-aircraft fire, the landings must take place eight miles from the target bridges. It was hoped that the jeeps, which would be landed by glider, would enable the Paris to get there quickly. The Paris could only take light weapons with them. Should they run into heavy German opposition, they would have problems unless the ground forces reached them quickly. As the plans were being finalized, intelligence reports were received that German armored units had arrived in the Arnhem area to refit. The reports were discounted, and it was decided that the landings must go ahead. Also, there was not sufficient airlift for the whole division, and it would have to be landed in three waves. Nevertheless, morale was high, as the divisional commander, Major General Roy Urquhart, wished his men well on the morning of Sunday the 17th of September. Operation Market Garden was underway. The advanced troops of the British 6th Airborne Division landed some eight miles north of Arnhem during the early afternoon. There was no sign of the enemy. Landing zones for follow-up troops were established and the Paras began to push forward towards Arnhem. but they were delayed by enthusiastic Dutch civilians and by the destruction of many of the gliders containing their jeeps. The intelligence reports proved correct. Two SS Panzer divisions were refitting in the area and they reacted quickly. The Paras were soon forced onto the defensive. Then in confused fighting near the town, General Urquhart, the divisional commander, was pinned down and cut off from his troops for more than a day. By evening, Colonel John Frost of the 2nd Parachute Battalion with about 100 of his men had managed to seize the northern end of one of the target bridges. But then Frost realized that they could get no further. A company uh, tried to uh, get across with one platoon. But um, when they were well up onto the, the um, bridge, I'm not exactly sure, but past that sort of pillbox thing there, uh, accurate fire was brought to bear from a vehicle, we like an armoured car on the far side. Well, 
it's, you're terribly vulnerable, as you know, on a bridge like that, and the bullets rattling down the road, and they have very heavy casualties almost straight away. Further attempts to seize the bridge were fruitless, and Frost and his men dug in. Tragically, amid the wreckage of a crashed glider, the Germans had found details of the plan to land follow-up forces the next day. They were waiting, and the men of 4th Parachute Brigade suffered terribly. They were also pinned down before reaching their comrades. The men at Arnhem now depended on the ground advance, which had already relieved the US paratroops at Eindhoven. But thereafter, German resistance increased and the advance slowed. Because of fog, it was not until day four of Operation Market Garden that the Polish parachute brigade was able to drop at Arnhem to reinforce the British Paris. Unfortunately, they were landed on the wrong side of the lower Rhine, and only a few were able to get across to Arnhem itself. The British Paris were suffering increasing casualties as the German pressure grew. Many of the supplies needed to sustain them fell into German hands. Supply aircraft were shot down in increasing numbers, but still the British and Polish Paris fought on. The ground advance eventually reached the lower Rhine, but by then the Paris at Arnhem were on their last legs. They were ordered to break out, but only some 2,000 of the 10,000 men who dropped at Arnhem were able to do so. The remainder were dead, or had been forced to surrender. Montgomery's gamble had failed, but the courage and tenacity of the Red Devils had been of the highest order. The Allies now realized that their supply situation could only be eased if they opened up the Belgian port of Antwerp. This meant clearing the river Skelt, especially the island of Valkeren at its mouth. The plan was for three Royal Marine commandos to land on the west coast of the island to subdue the formidable German coastal batteries, while number four commando, supported by an infantry brigade, crossed from Breskens to secure Flushing. The landings took place on the 1st of November, 1944. During the run-in, a number of landing craft were hit by shell fire. Nevertheless, the commandos got ashore and began the task of subduing the coastal guns. Meanwhile, number four commando was fighting its way through Flushing. The German resistance was intense and every street had to be cleared in savage hand-to-hand -hand fighting. It was 10 days before the German commander finally surrendered. Both Paris and commandos were in action when the Allies finally crossed the River Rhine in March 1945. 6th Airborne Division, together with American paratroops, dropping on the east bank. They landed in the German gun lines, and although they suffered casualties, the Paris totally disrupted the German defense. In contrast to Arnhem, the ground forces led by the commandos quickly linked up with the Paris. Thereafter, they took part in the final advance through Germany. The Paris' last job of the war was the liberation of Norway and the disarming of the large German garrison stationed there. Both the Red Berets of the Parachute Regiment and the Green Berets of the Commandos fulfilled Churchill's wish in summer 1940 for lightly equipped mobile forces to act like packs of hounds. They displayed courage and resilience in every theatre of World War II.
The same unquenchable spirit has continued to be shown in the years since 1945 by their descendants, today's Royal Marine Commandos and the Parachute Regiment. Both units fought epic battles during the Falklands War and were the first troops into Port Stanley, the capital. Like their forebears in World War II, they were true gladiators. Thank you.